Thank you, ladies. What a tremendous song, and we're grateful for worship through testimony like that. Praise the Lord, my Adonai. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Titus, where last week we began a series exploring God's Word in this particular letter, understanding more about God's design and desire for the church. As we continue in that exploration this week, we are transitioning from last week, as we saw in Paul's introduction and his greeting, how he wanted us to respond to our salvation in Christ, to where now he begins to formulate a pattern. He begins to sketch the blueprint. He begins to put into place those things which are necessary to establish the churches there on the island of Crete, where he had left Titus to put these things in place. This morning we're going to look at the role of leadership in the church. And anytime you talk about leadership, there's lots of things that come to mind. You know, we run into leadership in really every avenue of life. Leadership is necessary. I don't go so far as to say a necessary evil, though whatever your context or frame of reference, that may come to your mind. It's necessary in everything from a corporation to a small business to your home life, leadership is necessary, even into a neighborhood playgroup. There's always got to be some form of leadership. Leadership makes things go. It makes the world go round in many ways. But leadership of all these things is different from leadership within the church. Because leadership within the church is unique in the sense of it is decisively spiritual. Leadership within the church is decisively spiritual. And as Paul is instructing Titus as to how to establish the churches, he begins with the foundation of leadership, that which is necessary and everything else will be constructed on. You know, in recent decades, church leadership has undergone a change, a shift, if you will, in terms of public opinion, how it's viewed. You know, there was a day where it was an honorable thing to be a pastor. People who were pastors walked around, and when they were asked, what do you do for a living, they boldly proclaimed, well, I'm a pastor, maybe even with a smile on their face. Today, you meet many people who, when you ask them what's their vocation, and if it is vocationally employed by the church, they almost want to apologize and say, well, I'm a pastor, because they know the connotation it carries. The office of pastor has eroded in the view of public opinion in our society today. And really it's been on a a multifaceted or in various ways that this office has been attacked or it's eroded. For instance, the authority of the pastor has long since been removed. Much of this derives from the postmodern philosophy that permeates our culture and has seeped into the church, meaning people are opposed to any form of authority, especially one that's going to meddle into their personal life. And by opposing this authority, they become resistant to the instruction from someone who possesses that authority. They not only resist it, they begin to resent those who occupy positions of authority. And so the authority of the pastor has eroded as a result of these things. The admiration of the pastor has also eroded. Much of this is not from outside influence, Sadly, it's from the pitiful testimony of those who have occupied the the office and failed. Everything from the scandals of the Catholic priesthood into the moral failures financially and otherwise of Protestant pastors that occupy the headlines anytime it happens. It's ultimately removed any admiration that exists within our culture of someone who occupies the office of pastor Pastor has become the punchline for a joke rather than that which is esteemed or honored. The authority of the pastoral office is gone. The admiration of the pastoral office is withering away. But then you also have the affection of the pastoral office that has been questioned now because so many people have been really discovered for having wrong motives. They've been uncovered with some of their dishonest practices or how they've somehow manipulated people or abused the money or the financial gain that they've really obtained through deceptive means 
with a ministry veil. Because of that, the affection of a pastor is now seen as somehow secondary or at best insincere. People question the sincerity of a pastor who would call with concern or express love or kindness or even offer forgiveness as someone who is being hypocritical or judgmental. Their affection is now questioned. So when you look at the leadership of the church, there's never been a more crucial time to understand what is leadership supposed to look like? What standards does God have of leaders, pastors within the church? And what can a congregation, a family of faith, a local body of believers expect from a pastor? Well, the Bible answers that question in Titus chapter 1. In Paul's letter to Titus, he explains the qualifications and expectations of a pastor. So reading with me, let's pick up in verse 5 of Titus chapter 1 and let's understand more of the role of leadership in the church through the qualifications of pastors. Starting in verse 5, the Bible says this, Paul writing to Titus, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders into every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or an insubordination, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. Instead, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the, to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. Would you pray with me? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you ultimately as the head of the church. Jesus, you are Lord of the church, the chief shepherd. Lord, as we unite as your people, your family of faith, the bride of Christ, your holy church. We desire to reflect the outline, the blueprint, the design that you have established. Lord, and that begins with the establishment of leadership, understanding what it looks like, what the expectations that you have are, and Lord, how it can affect the body of Christ. So God, now teach us from your word to understand these things more clearly. So Father, that we may leave changed as a result of your truth this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you begin to look at this passage, it starts by discussing something that needs to be addressed or defined from the outset. He describes what's referred to as an office, an office, a place that is occupied within the church, that which exists within the church structure or in church polity. And he refers to it with a couple of different terms. And I want us to begin by understanding how these terms relate. Because in churches today, there's a lot of confusion when you see the titles of those who are in leadership. You may hear people referred to as bishop or elder or pastor. And you wonder, what do those terms mean and why do they use different terms? I want to explain a couple of those things. If you look at the screen, you'll see the various terms that the Bible uses. 
There's three terms in the original language. The first term is typically translated elder. You would recognize the Greek word by its English counterpart. The Greek word for elder is presbyteros. The English counterpart is presbytery or presbyterian. So you understand what this means or where it derives its uh, connotation from. But the term elder is there. Then you have the term that is translated here even in verse 7, overseer. This same term is translated sometimes in various translations or by denominations as bishop. Bishop or overseer. You too would recognize this word from the original language in the English counterpart. The original Greek word for this is episkopos, which we get our word episcopal or episcopalian from. So bishop or overseer. And therefore you see many in that denomination referring to their pastor or leader as a bishop. Then you have the term pastor or shepherd. The term literally in the Greek is shepherd, poemen. But we have translated it or we understand it or use it commonly as pastor. So pastor, bishop, elder, pastor, overseer, elder. These three terms. Now, let's be clear. These three terms are used interchangeably in the scripture. They do not distinguish with different offices. In other words, there's not an office of overseer, an office of pastor, and an office of an elder. They are all used synonymously. You can look at 1 Timothy 3, and he refers to the terms similarly or in the same way, using them in exchange. Here in Titus 1, he says, appoint elders, but then he calls them, in verse 7, an overseer. In Acts 20, as Paul addresses the Ephesian elders before he is about to depart, he uses all the terms synonymously when he tells them to exercise oversight because they are elders, that they are to shepherd the flock. Peter does the same thing in 1 Peter 5. When he instructs elders to shepherd the flock and to provide oversight, using these same terms to describe the one office, the office of the premier leader or responsible leader within the church, that of a pastor. So we'll use that term pastor understanding the terms that are synonymous with them in the scriptures. Now, when you use those terms, it doesn't just describe the office. There's also some function embedded within the nature of those terms. For instance, if you look at the term elder, what does it communicate? The connotation it has is someone who has wisdom or counsel or guidance. And so when you think of the pastoral office and you use the term elder, or the Bible uses this term, this is some of the implications that it would have in terms of the function within that office. Wisdom, guidance, counsel. When you think of bishop or overseer, It's one who provides oversight, who gives direction or vision for the church. When you think of the term pastor or shepherd, it has the connotation of care or compassion and even nourishment, the responsibility of feeding and nourishing the flock. So with these terms, you not only find the titles of the office, but the function embedded within them. So this is the office of pastor. This is what we mean when we say he, he is a pastor. And as Paul begins to describe what is required of a pastor, we can then understand who he's talking about, who he's referring to. Not just any person, but one who occupies this office that serves in these functions. So what are God's expectations for pastors? What, God, what does God desire to see within a pastor? And what requirements does he hold, uphold for anyone who serves in the position of pastor? Well, let's look at them. Really, they can be understood within three categories. And the first one is this. Pastors must display the fundamentals. Pastors must display the fundamentals. When you look at the first few verses of what Paul describes, he describes the personal life of a pastor and one that is characterized by basic Christian character. And within that character... He establishes some expectations, some guidelines, some understanding that these are fundamental characteristics of any Christian, but they are requirements of every pastor. A pastor cannot qualify, or a person cannot qualify as a pastor if he does not display the fundamentals. These fundamentals are displayed in various components or aspects of his life. First, a pastor must exhibit domestic dignity. When you look at the fundamentals, it starts at home. A pastor must display domestic dignity. Look at what he says. 
In verse 6, if anyone is above reproach. Now this term, above reproach, is somewhat the umbrella term that he uses to describe the office of pastor. Someone must be above reproach. Literally, that means blameless. One against whom an accusation doesn't stick. It doesn't mean perfect, okay? It doesn't mean they don't make mistakes, but it means that they are above reproach, that accusations do not stick. And when they fall or when they fail, it's an exception, not the rule, and they're willing to admit it and to overcome it. That must be above reproach. But then he puts that within the context of the home, the domestic dignity of a pastor. He uses this phrase there in verse 6, he must be the husband of one wife, literally a one-woman man. This phrase is really a, a term that has so much that goes along with it. Certainly the phrase one-woman man or the husband of one wife does not require a pastor to be married or forbid someone who is a widower from serving as a pastor. What it does prohibit clearly is someone who would have multiple wives, a polygamist. It certainly would prohibit someone who is an adulterer from serving in this capacity. Some would question or dispute whether this means that someone who's been divorced can or cannot serve in this capacity. That's not so much directly tied to this qualification as much as it is to your understanding of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. However, it does touch on it through this context, and I personally would believe that it does disqualify someone who's been divorced from serving in the pastoral capacity. Bear in mind that that does not mean that they cannot be used by God, that they cannot be used magnificently by God, or certainly with great impact by God. But it does reserve the office from those who have experienced that hardship and that trial within their life. Others who disagree with that, I simply exercise Christian grace and liberty, understanding that there are differences of opinion as it relates to that restriction or qualification. Here's what we know with certainty. The husband of one wife is devoted to, committed to, and faithful to the woman who is his wife. This prohibits someone who is addicted to pornography or any other sexually illicit pattern of behavior. It also would speak against those who possess inappropriate relationships with someone other than their wife. A pastor should be above reproach, and there should be no question as you watch his interaction with a, someone of the opposite sex, a woman, there should be no question that he is fully devoted to his wife based on that interaction. Sadly, too many pastors have fallen by the wayside at this very point. The first one on the list, the husband of one wife. By the way, the terminology here is gender specific. It doesn't say the spouse of one spouse. I believe it does reserve the office of pastor as a masculine office, that which must be occupied by a male. Husband of one wife, part of his domestic dignity. But Paul also explains that that domestic dignity and his commitment to his wife would also be reflected in his commitment to his children. Look what he says. The husband of one wife and his children must also be believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or wild living and insubordination, rebellion. Now certainly, a pastor has no control over salvation. He's not sovereign over his children's salvation. Therefore, he cannot be required to ensure that they are saved, but that the pastor would do everything in his power to raise his children in the nurture, discipline, and admonition of the Lord, according to Ephesians 6, 4, giving them every opportunity to trust Christ based on his leadership. And as believers, it would follow that their pattern of behavior would not be one that is characterized by debauchery, wild living, or insubordination, and certainly those things would not be permitted while they are living under his supervision or his leadership within his home. So a pastor must exhibit domestic dignity. This is all part of the fundamentals of Christian character, but it's not just in domestic dignity that he must exhibit these things. He must exhibit the fundamentals in his personal integrity, in his personal integrity. Paul now begins to expand it beyond just his home and his personal life into his character. Verses 7 and 8 
use 11 descriptive terms. The first five in verse 7 are from a negative perspective, what his character should not be. The last six terms in verse 8 are from the positive perspective, what his character should be. So what does a man of personal integrity look like? Well, as he begins verse 7, look there, you see, he says, For an overseer, there he uses the term, referring to the pastor, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. Again, the overarching umbrella requirement as it relates to his character and his conduct. And then he describes the personal integrity he must have. He must not be arrogant. The term here describes someone who is not after their own selfish concerns, but is focused on God's concern and on the concern of others rather than on his concern for self. Arrogant, puffed up, prideful, self-interested rather than God and other focused. Not arrogant, not quick-tempered. What this means is that a pastor shouldn't have a short fuse. He must not be impatient or easily provoked. He then uses the term uh, a drunkard. He must not be a drunkard. Specifically, this is one who gives himself to self-indulgence, particularly as it relates to alcohol. But I believe that trait would extend beyond just the use of alcohol. One who is not self-indulgent, but exercises good judgment, sober judgment, right judgment. Now, as it particularly relates to alcohol, I believe this prohibition, not a drunkard, one who is controlled by wine, must be considered in light of today's context and our culture, where the pastor bears an enormous responsibility to model the highest regard for godly things. He must be above reproach, and he bears the responsibility of serving as an example to all those who are under his direction and leadership and to those who are watching with careful eyes his lifestyle. For that reason, I believe that today's pastor should not exercise what some would construe as Christian liberty in the partaking of any alcohol, but would in fact practice abstinence from alcohol, maintaining that above reproach quality as it relates specifically to the issue of alcoholic beverages. Not a drunkard, not violent. The term violent here includes more than just physical abuse. It includes verbal abuse, emotional abuse. A pastor should not be abusive in any of these ways. It should not be characteristic of his life. He should not be, last in verse 7, greedy for gain. Greedy for gain. This is one who is in it with the wrong motive, serving the church of God, putting forth the truth of God simply for the sake of monetary gain. The Bible is clear. The church has a responsibility to provide for the needs of a pastor. But the Bible is equally clear. A pastor should not serve the church specifically for or motivated by the material wealth or gain that can come as a result. Those who do so in an extreme fashion, I believe, disqualify themselves because they should not be in it for greedy gain, shortcutting things. In fact, pastors should be known for just the opposite, generosity and graciousness. One who's not in it for greedy gain. But then you look at the positive attributes what should it be characterized? Those are the prohibitions. What should his personal integrity be characterized? Look at what he says in verse 7. He must, uh, verse 8, excuse me, he must be hospitable. That means literally a lover of strangers. One who is kind to those he does not know. Does not demonstrate prejudice in any form or fashion. Whether based on race, socioeconomic status, background, mistakes, sins, or any other life circumstances should not be part of his evaluation as he interacts with others. He should be hospitable, loving people in an unbiased way. Whether that's entertaining in his home or welcoming him to the house of God, both should be included as he is hospitable. A pastor should be someone who is a, a lover of good, it says. A lover of good is 
one who cares about the things of God and evaluates the goodness of things according to God's standards of goodness. In other words, one who clearly knows right from wrong, good from evil, and is passionate about the things which honor God, a lover of good. He says, one who is self-controlled, self-controlled. If you put it in some other terminology, you might explain that a pastor should know the difference between reacting and responding. He should have self-control. A pastor must also be one who is upright or righteous, as your translation may say. Righteous. This is someone who is fair, who is even-handed in his treatment of others. One whose life is characterized by a righteous, godly lifestyle. That's supported by the next attribute. He must be holy. Holy speaks to the personal purity of the pastor. One who is set apart and distinguished by godly conduct and character. He then says one who is disciplined. Disciplined. Who exercises self-control. Has structure and discipline built into his life. One that is not determined or led by his own emotions, by other people's opinions. He is disciplined in his life to follow the leading of the Lord and the Spirit. All of these characteristics speak to the personal integrity that are requ- is required of anyone who bears the title or occupies the office of pastor. A pastor must exhibit domestic dignity. A pastor must exhibit personal integrity. But a pastor must also exhibit one final fundamental characteristic. He must exhibit spiritual maturity. He must exhibit spiritual maturity. When you look in verse 9, he begins to describe a pastor as one who holds firm to the trustworthy word as taught meaning as he has learned it, he does not waver. And as he teaches it, he does not waver. But he has an understanding, look what it says, so that he may be able to give instruction. A pastor must be spiritually mature because he's leading the maturity of those who are within the local congregation. Therefore, he must have his own spiritual maturity That's best characterized by his understanding of God and his handling of the Word of God. Paul, in the parallel passage in 1 Timothy, where he also lists the qualifications of a pastor, of an elder, specifically says he must not be a new convert because he runs the danger of uh, of falling into arrogance or believing his own press, giving into the compliments that come from serving as a pastor. One who does not have spiritual maturity is not grounded. He runs the risk of floating away on his inflated ego. Therefore, a pastor must exhibit spiritual maturity. One that handles situations with wisdom, with discretion, all based on the transforming power of God's word in his own life so that he can then pour into that, pour, in, pour that into others' lives. A pastor must display the fundamentals, domestic dignity, personal integrity, spiritual maturity. These things are requirements for the pastoral office. Secondly, a pastor must not only display the fundamentals, a pastor must disciple the flock. A pastor must disciple The flock, out of his character and out of his own spiritual maturity must come the leadership that draws, beckons, and nourishes other believers to spiritual maturity. Look at how he describes it in verse 7. You say, as he begins there, for an overseer, as God's steward, You see, a pastor must disciple the flock, understanding that the people under his charge do not belong to him. He is God's steward. It's not the pastor's church. It's God's church. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. 
He is the Lord of, church, of the church. A pastor is simply a steward, a manager. What does he manage? Is he's discipling the flock. Well, he is a manager. He is a steward of God's church, and he must prove to be a faithful steward of God's church, one who is faithful to those who are placed under his charge. You know, the Bible speaks of this in Hebrews 13, 17. It describes those who are in leadership are to give an account for the souls that they watch over. The enormous responsibility that pastors bear goes largely unnoticed by the average churchgoer or common Christian. It's not paraded by a godly pastor. It's not something that is spoken of very much, but it's a burden, one that he bears with joy, but great responsibility, that the spiritual life of the congregation and the people that he loves and is devoted to rests in large part on his shoulders. Oh, what a great responsibility a pastor has to be a faithful steward of God's church, that he would disciple the flock. As so, he is not just a faithful steward of God's church, he is a faithful steward of God's word. Verse 9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word. To hold firm means that he sticks to it, that he grasps tightly, and that he will not let go under any circumstance. He cements his life connecting it to the trustworthy word that is unshakable and unbreakable. The word of God as it's taught so that he may give instruction to others in sound doctrine, leading them to spiritual health. That sound doctrine, healthy teaching. One of the themes we looked at last week in the book of Titus is the pastor's responsibility. It's not only the pastor's responsibility, but listen, when the church gathers together in a weekly assembly to worship the Lord, to be encouraged and challenged in their faith, a pastor bears the responsibility of faithfully communicating the Word of God, feeding the flock with a healthy dose and diet of God's truth. For this reason, a pastor must preach the Word and must not compromise, give it in to those who would gather to listen to something less than the truth, something less than God's Word, something less than than the biblical instruction that is sound teaching. Pastors must preach. Those who do not, those who simply offer self-help tutorials, inspiring talks, things which make you feel good, do not qualify under the biblical instruction of what their responsibility is to be, and that is to disciple the flock, being a faithful steward to God's church, giving one of them what they deserve and what they need as he handles the word of truth as a faithful steward of that truth, devoting himself to the faithful teaching and preaching of God's word, nothing less and nothing more. A pastor must display the fundamentals a pastor bears the responsibility to disciple the flock. The third characteristic that a pastor must demonstrate or model is that a pastor must defend the faith. A pastor must defend the faith. He sees to give healthy instruction or sound teaching to those who are under his charge and who are following his lead. But he must also, according to verse 9, be able to rebuke those who contradict it. In other words, to those who stand in opposition to God's word, a pastor has the responsibility to correct them, to rebuke them, to speak against them. This must be done in conjunction with the godly character and personal integrity that was described earlier. But nonetheless, it must be stated, it must be stood for. God's truth must be defended by the pastor. Pastor, as he teaches his congregation, helps them understand how to defend the truth and stand for the truth. And Paul uses this to transition. If this is the pastor's responsibility, it should easily identify those who are not fulfilling this responsibility, those who are what he calls false teachers. And he uses scandalous terms to describe them. 
certainly less than encouraging terminology to describe them. But the responsibility of the pastor is summarized in the word that he uses in three different places. In verse 9, he says that he is to rebuke those who contradict it, to correct, to confront. In verse 11, speaking of the false teachers, he says that they must be silenced. Their teaching must be overshadowed and muted by healthy teaching, by confrontation. And then in verse 13, he says, therefore, rebuke them sharply. The pastor must defend the truth. He must teach his congregation to do so as well. You know, the best defense against being deceived is discipleship. The best defense against deception is discipleship. This is why the pastor must teach the word and why he must defend the word. As he teaches healthy, sound doctrine, he will protect his people, who will then be able to spot the counterfeits, the deceptive, false teachers, based on the truth they know and have been taught. But to help us out, Paul actually describes those who are guilty of false teaching. And I believe the way he positions it right after the qualifications of a pastor that he's also insinuating that there are those who abuse the office who actually look like this. So what are false teachers characterized by? False teachers are characterized by a number of things. First, false teaching is masked by deceptive content. Look what he says in verse 10. There are many who are insubordinate or rebellious, empty talkers and deceivers. Empty talkers describes the worthlessness, the uselessness, the emptiness of their message. Sadly today, there are so many who are promoting a false gospel that has been truncated, robbed of the very essence of its meaning. Easy believism, health, wealth, prosperity, what's known as a pop gospel is being sold and delivered. It's deceptive in its content. It uses terminology that's familiar to us that we would endorse, all the while misleading and deceiving those who attach themselves to it. This doctrine is characterized by that which minimizes sin, maximizes self, and misrepresents the Savior. It always has one or all three of those components. It minimizes sin. Those who won't speak of sin remove the very need for a Savior. Those who maximize self misplace the direction which our souls are meant to be guided. It's meant to be towards God, not towards self. But when we maximize our interests, we run away from the very thing which God desires, and that's his interest. And those who misrepresent the Savior in some way, in some way distort the person or the work of Jesus Christ, that he's somehow less than God, that his death, burial, and resurrection was simply a, an example to us and that we are saved simply by affirming the reality of its occurrence. These things are all deceptive content that masks false teaching. Ultimately, those who do it, he says, are insubordinate. They themselves are rebellious against God. The next time you say, well, those preachers don't really mean any harm by it, the Bible says they are insubordinate to God by what they are teaching. He mentions those of the circumcision party. That was those who were adding to the gospel, saying that you must be converted to Judaism and follow the, the rules of Judaism, specifically circumcision, to be saved. Fast, false teaching is masked by deceptive content. Also, false teaching is marked by a divisive influence. By a divisive influence. Verse 11, he says, they must be silenced. Because they are upsetting whole families. Oftentimes, false teaching focuses on and finds little nooks and crannies to hide in. Because people are more easily deceived when they're on their own or by themselves or in a smaller group. Particularly here, he 
puts it in the context of a family, someone who would go and sit in their home, perhaps even knock on their door, and attempt to deceive them or mislead them. But that can also happen within the context of the church. And in doing so, he upsets families. And now the family of faith becomes upset because families are believing different things and they are found to be in opposition of one another. False teaching is marked by divisive influence. Listen, you want to look for controversy within the church? You'll find it. And when you do, almost always there is a false teaching associated with it. Almost always there's a doctrine that someone's chasing, that someone's running after, that someone's promoting, that's misleading others, upsetting families, and causing division within the church. Look what else he says. False teaching is also motivated by dishonest gain. He says they must be silenced and they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not teach. A false teacher has a false motive. This is in direct contrast to what we saw at the end of verse 7. A godly pastor is not greedy for gain, but a false teacher is motivated by it. Motivated by it. And abuses the opportunity to teach others in a way that serves his own self-interest. Gain. Material wealth. Not only is false teaching motivated by dishonest gain, false teaching is also manifested in disgraceful behavior. False teaching is manifested in disgraceful behavior. And what I mean by that is this. A faulty foundation will always result in a moral collapse. A faulty foundation will always result in a moral collapse. When someone begins believing something that's not true, certainly teaching things that aren't true, their lifestyle will eventually demonstrate that it's untrue because their lifestyle will collapse morally. He describes this in verses 12, 13, and 14. Look what he says in verse 12. 12. He says, for one of the Cretans, meaning one of their own, right? One who is part of them, one who is secular, says this about Cretans. A prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Gluttons. Specifically, this is the 6th century B.C. uh, poet, Epimenides, who lived on the island of Crete, and he was celebrating their ungodly lifestyle. Cretans are always liars, perpetually dishonest, evil beasts, those who are devoting themselves to their ungodly passions, and lazy gluttons. They're freeloaders seeking to get something for nothing. He says, this testimony about Cretans is true, but listen to what he says. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, In other words, those who have begun to follow their pattern but are professing faith in Christ but living a lifestyle of this are those who are teaching false things, ungodly truth, or not false truth, falsity. He says their pattern will begin to display itself in this disgraceful behavior. He says, so, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. In other words, if you want to correct their lifestyle, correct their faith. Too many times the church has busied itself by condemning ungodly lifestyle. We should stand for moral absolutes and truth as it relates to right or wrong. But we have to understand that telling them what's right or wrong will never never ultimately convince them. He says, don't just tell them what's right or wrong, but rebuke them sharply, sharply, but do so that they may be sound in the faith. The goal is is their faith, not their lifestyle. He says in verse 14, they're not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. In other words, you're leading them towards the truth, not away from it, as false teachers do. Then he uses terminology, to the pure, all things are pure. What he's saying is, those who are godly and have a godly foundation and are following and sitting under godly truth, their lifestyle reflects it. All things are pure. Their lifestyle reflects their character that has been developed through the truth. But both, but to the unbelieving, to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. In other words, even if they are living somewhat moral lifestyles, if their character is defiled and unbelieving, it soils even their lifestyle. And at some point, it will reveal itself. 
but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. False teaching is manifested in disgraceful behavior. It always comes out. Lastly, false teaching is manufactured from the deprived heart. It comes from a deprived heart. Some may say a depraved heart. Both terms would be fitting. A heart that is sickened by sin is not purified. Therefore, he says in verse 16, they profess to know God, but by him, by their deeds, they deny him. They are detestable. To be detestable means they are an abomination to God. They are disobedient. That means they are in opposition to God. And they are unfit for any good work, which means they are useless to God. A pastor who is teaching false teaching is described in this way. The goal of his true teaching or sound teaching is to lead others away from those who would deceive them and lead them down this destructive path. Pastors must display the fundamentals. Pastors must disciple the flock. And pastors must defend the faith. As we close this morning, I want us to close with personal application for us, individually and as a church. How should we respond? How should we respond? The first way we need to respond is this. We need to seek godly leadership. We need to seek godly leadership. I'm thankful for a search committee who is devoted to looking for someone who qualifies under these standards. You want to know what the profile of the next senior pastor of Edmonds First Baptist Church looks like? We just read it. We just read it. It's not dictated or determined by other superficial characteristics. By the way, let us emphasize that those things which are most important, recognizing the significance and the benef beneficial aspects that maybe are less significant. But let us keep the primary things on the front burner. Listen, the best senior pastor may not be the one who has a magnetic personality. Let's measure him first and foremost by the godly standards. I love the words of Robert Murray McShane, a 19th century pastor who died well before his time, but he understood what he needed to prioritize in his life. It wasn't parading his personality. It wasn't even promoting his giftedness. He said, my people's greatest need is my personal holiness. My people's greatest need is my personal holiness. The next pastor of this church should be focused less on his reputation, less on his giftedness, less on his abilities, and most importantly, on the character and the standards that God is holding him to, first and foremost. That's the profile of a pastor. We must seek godly leadership. Second thing we must do, we must support godly leadership. We must support godly leadership. You know, the Bible uses the term elders or pastors in a single context, but with plurality. Meaning, he accounts for and even endorses multiple pastors in a local congregation. Now, for larger churches, it's more easily recognized. Listen, the godly leaders that you have that occupy not just directors of ministry, but pastoral offices with specific responsibilities of oversight. You have godly leaders, and aren't you grateful? They have been faithful during this time of interim to continue to minister and love the people of Edmonds First Baptist Church. As the family of faith, we must always understand that part of our responsibility is to support godly leadership. Sadly, some people feel like it's their duty, their responsibility, or even their giftedness to be a constant thorn in the side of leadership. Please, I beg you, I don't know of anyone that exists in this church like that, but I also admit I don't know everyone in this church. <laughs> and because of that, I can implore you to say, Please recognize the truth in Hebrews 13, 17. I spoke of it in the responsibility of the leader earlier, that he gives an account to God. 
one who is watching over your souls. But the instruction there is to the people. Obey your leaders and submit to them. That does not mean to blindly follow. It should be godly qualified leadership. But it says, do so in a way that allows them to minister to you in a joyful way. In other words, in a way that makes it a blessing to them, not a burden. Because it says, if you don't, it will be unprofitable for you. In other words, it will be to your detriment if you're not supporting the leadership because you will not benefit from what that leadership has to offer. Therefore, we must not just seek godly leadership. We must support godly leadership. I'm thankful for the supporting nature of this family of faith. Lastly, how should we respond? We must submit to God's leadership. We must submit to God's leadership. This has a twofold aspect to it. I want you to understand something that I feel very strongly about. A, a church without a senior pastor does not stop being the church. A church is still a church in the absence or the presence of a senior pastor. A church, a local congregation, a family of faith is not defined by the personality or the person in the office of senior pastor. We must follow God's leadership. The Bible says, in giving instruction to under shepherds, pastors, that they do so in a way that ultimately the chief shepherd would approve of. And in the absence of a senior pastor, the chief shepherd, the Lord himself, still continues to offer guidance and direction in conjunction with the other remaining leadership that's in place that God placed there providentially, knowing the circumstances that different churches would find themselves in in the absence of a senior pastor. So we must submit to God's leadership. God is still on the throne. Jesus is the head of our church. There's another aspect of that. In submitting to God's leadership, I want you to understand, and we're going to close with this, the practical nature of this passage beyond describing the office. You see, what he describes as requirements for a pastor is not restricted to a pastor. It may be the requirements for every pastor, but it's the responsibility for every believer. The responsibility of every believer is to live up to these same standards. These are the qualifications of a pastor, but they should be the qualities of every believer. You see, what God requires from pastors he desires in all of us. The office and the description of the people who occupy that office does not describe someone who is elite. It should describe everybody who is following Jesus Christ. And so as you look at these standards, maybe it was encouraging to say, yeah, that's what I want in a senior pastor. That's what I want in a pastor. That's what I expect all our pastors to live up to. Are you living up to the same standards? Because God's holding you to them. Would you bow with me?